Hey, praise the Lord. <laughs> We're back. Back to video. No, but seriously, it's kind of nice to praise the Lord because in everything, we should give thanks and praise. Whether it be something that you enjoy, whether it be something you're employed in, whether it be good news or bad news. Regardless of what it is, regardless of how you perceive it, the reality of God being the one who has allowed us another day of breath, another day of living, another reality to go through this time perspective that we call from the rising of the sun to the setting down thereof, the name of the Lord should be praised. We should give thanks and praise. And so, Father, I thank you. I praise you. I give you all the glory and honor that's due to you as being the creator of the universe that you've allowed us one more day to come together, to be together, to find ourselves with you by your spirit, allowing what you're doing in our lives to join with other believers who are following you, who are getting to know you, who are learning to love you, who want to know that with which you have given us, the Holy Spirit, that we might be able to hear that we might be able to see, that we might be able to know what is the mysteries, the unveiling of your son Jesus. So Father, I pray for those who do not know you, that even now they would get to know you. For those who do not have ears to hear, that they would receive the Holy Spirit, even as I pray now, receive the Holy Spirit. That they would be baptized unto a baptism they know nothing about, spiritually born again. Cause them now, God, by your Spirit to be born again. Now, if you're not born again, all I can say is ask. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be open. Because I'm not going to say anything that is contrary to what Jesus said. I'm not going to say anything that's in conflict with what Jesus said. As a matter of fact, I'm going to remind you of what Jesus said. <laughs> you could call me a Jesus freak that way. I'll remind you what Jesus said is pretty simple. Jesus said that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. You must be born again. Now a lot of people want to take and make what they have received from hearing only their faith. Well, that's a good thing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And maybe you could get away with calling the Bible the Word of God. But you see, without there being the Spirit of God, then it's really just a book. And I could sit here until I'm blue in the face and talk to you and share with you and relate to you everything that's happened in my life. All the miracles I see every day, and my wife is one of the ones who have married me, walked with me, talked with me, and seen what happens being around a Christian. Well, so much so she got saved. And she is also likewise in her own right and her own will and her own way had God revealed to her miracles. Now I'll admit sometimes people call some things a miracle that maybe they aren't. Some people do things they claim are miracles and maybe they aren't. Me personally, I think everything's a miracle, but no, I'm, when I use the word miracle in the context of a Bible study, then I mean those things that are not natural according to what the natural man, which means the non-born-again Christian, the non-Christian, the person who doesn't believe in God, would have to say, there's something there. <laughs> Don't know what it is, but there's something there. That's what I call a miracle. And you may call it sometimes kismet and some of the things that happen in your life, but I got news for you. Nothing happens by happenstance or by circumstance. All things work together for good to those that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. Now that doesn't mean that everything in your life is going to work out good. It just means that according to His purpose, it will be good. That could be your death. That could be a good thing. Could be your life. That could be a good thing. That is for the will of God to be made manifest, not for us to determine what's best for us. If you're making your own choices according to your own will, then you're not a Christian. You're not born again. But if you've given your life over, if you said, hey, you know, I can't take it anymore. I've lost it, man. You know, nothing satisfies. 
Nothing makes me feel good. Nothing seems to be good. I've looked at the government. I've looked at the politicians. I've looked at jobs. I've looked at society. I've gone around the world and everything I've looked at, whether it be philosophy, Confucianism, Mormons, Catholics, Protestants, Evangelicals, or anyone, it just doesn't seem good for me. Well, I got news for you. Matter of fact, I got great news for you. There is customization when it comes to walking in a relationship with Jesus. Yeah, seriously. In other words, you know how you get your phone, you know, your smartphone, you know, it's kind of like about as big as my hand nowadays, you know, and they all learn how to thumb it. You know, I really haven't figured that out yet, but, you know, I'm doing pretty good with my tech background that I can use, you know, my other finger and do it pretty good. My thumb's a little fat, doesn't seem to work right. Skinny up. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but you know how you get your phone and people have loaded it with a lot of extra junk, you know, the apps you can't get rid of that, you know, the, you use them at first and they seem good, but there's also some extra ones you don't use, that you don't really need. Well, that's kind of what church does. You know, they give you salvation or they'll give you a church message and, you know, it's like a smartphone, you know, it, it has a lot of good stuff in it. As long as you stick with the stuff, you're okay. But when you finally realize there's more to communication than just your apps, you want to customize it. You want to make it fit for you. You don't want to waste time going through something somebody else decided for you. You want to <coughs> have the information so you can make a determination according to what works for you. Well, you have a special app. It's called, or he is called, the Holy Spirit. He is the part of being born again that some people maybe get carried away on. You know, like Pentecostals and Charismatics and some people that go, Wee -oo, you know, roll around on the floor, or bark like dogs, or do whatever they do. You know, they get carried away. It doesn't mean they don't have the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean they're not saved. It just means that they've been so, you know, like, I don't know, caught in a suit and tie and short hair and kind of like in their own little shtick for so long. When suddenly God sets them free, they go, Wee -wee, you know, and they run around like little kids in diapers and you know how little kids in diapers are. You know, they play and then they'll take off their diaper and they'll still keep playing. Put the diaper on. <laughs> you get the picture? That's kind of what happens with Pentecostals or people that get carried away with the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is a person. He's part of the Trinity. He's part of what we call the Trinity. Really, it's all God. I mean, to put it bluntly, it's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. How all that works together? You don't know, I don't know. We're not going to know for sure. We understand what we understand, and we can, you know, make little diagrams, you know, is this, not that, of this, of that, or whatever. And that's nice. But really, even Jesus said, you know, when he came to the earth to reveal his Father, to instruct us because we were sitting in darkness and then we saw a great light and we went, wow! Look at him. Well, he said, you know, you get a handle on what you can see here on earth, but you have no clue what's going on, really. And part of reading the book of John, we begin to realize that. When we read the book of Revelation, written by John, we realize, huh. And I thought I knew it all until you read the book of Revelation, you realize you're not the center of the universe. You're not the most important object going on in all of creation. You're not like, you know, quote unquote, the head of the food chain. <laughs> no, you're not. You were created for God's good pleasure. You were created to have fellowship or to have communication, interlocution, interrogatory, intercourse with the master of the universe the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the greatest force in the universe, bigger than Star Wars. There aren't too many like that now because the force has awakened. <laughs> hmm. At least money-wise. And while it's nice to make a general, broad kind of like idea about, well, there's this force that controls the universe and, you know, it's good or it's evil, you know, it's a yin, it's a yang, it's this or that. You know, you can kind of work it into Christianity, and you know, it kind of works, and sort of not. But the individuality of having your phone customized just for you, having you put on those programs that you want, that's what it is about the Holy Spirit. 
He has caused you to come to a place like today, giving you the ability to sit down and listen to what it is He would say. He has, by His Spirit and His own choice, determined with God the Father and God the Son what is best for you and is uniquely and distinctly customizing what you're going to hear that applies to you. Now, a lot of people call that expositional teaching. They expound upon, they expose, they literally, if you wanted to use the right word, preach the word. And then they just kind of go, well, you know, God, you know, give them ears to ear and let them go, you know, and who knows, maybe you get it, maybe you won't. I like to put it a different way. While it's nice to be a preacher, and that's what I am, I preach the Word of God, I've sat down and taught people and, you know, they learn. Eventually, sooner or later, one way or another. But the Jewish way, the Jesus way, the reality of what Jesus did when it came to teaching wasn't simply standing up on a mountaintop and say, hey, here's all my sayings, the Beatitudes, blessed are you if you do them, if you don't, guess what? Your house will fall down, your world will come to an end, things will go wrong in your life. But if you do them, hey, you'll be like a householder who built his house upon a rock. All these things, you'll be blessed if you do these things. Now, the things that he gave you to do are pretty incredible. Love your enemies. Bless those that despitefully use you and persecute you. I mean, to put it bluntly, if I looked at what Jesus said, I couldn't do them. And I really can't. But that is the bar. Now, I have done them. I do do them. And the way that I'm capable of doing them is the Holy Spirit within me can do those things. Jesus could not wander in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights without eating or drinking. And don't get me wrong. There is no such thing as a Jewish fast that to put somebody out into the desert. Desert, remember. Desert, you know, where supposedly if he was doing the desert thing, you know, like out in the, driven out into the wilderness, and you're going to tell me that he was on a water fast and he found water while he was out there? A little flaky and shaky on your doctrine there. I got news for you. The way that he was able to be without water and food and he was athirst, where he was dying of thirst, was by way of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the one that Jesus said, oh man, you don't get it, bros. Here, let me tell you something on the night that he was betrayed. He said, it's better I go. So don't mourn for me because I'm telling you I'm going to be with my Father. It's better I leave so that you'll receive the Holy Spirit. Here, receive him now. Blew on him and bingo. They received at least an idea of what it would be. Now, it took him a little while longer to kind of get the full impact of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. They had to wait on the Lord. They had to go and be obedient to what God said to do in order to receive the Holy Spirit. That might be something you're going through. Maybe you don't have the Holy Spirit and you don't know even what a Bible study is. So you'll learn some, you'll do some, but you can't experience all until you give God your all in all. And that's what the disciples had to do, finally. While Jesus was resurrected from the dead and still on the earth before he exited stage right, he said, look, you know, um, you're going back to fishing, Peter. You know, do you love me? You know, and Peter says, well, yeah, you know, I was fishing, you know, and you made fish. And it's kind of like, well, I guess you can provide better than I can provide, so maybe I should abide in you. Abide means to trust in the Lord with all your heart. That means everything. Your job, your wife, your kids, your family, your your latest tech device. It means if God says something, you do it. You know, it's like, yes sir, no sir, do so sir. Yeah, that's right. That's what a Lord is. So, if you want Jesus as Lord of your life, you know, you got to get the Holy Spirit. And you can get him. You can ask him. He will fill you. But, until you do, you're just a person following from a distance, maybe a little closer, Jesus like the 70 were, or the 120 were, or like the 5,000 were just to see the signs and miracles and wonders, you know. And there are lots of people in church that are like thousands going to church. There might be 120 of them that out of maybe a thousand or two or 5,000 that actually do follow Jesus. There might be 70 that are even closer to Jesus. But really, 
if you want to nail it, there's probably only about 12 that are going to really follow that intimately. Many are called, but few are chosen. Jesus said, broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there go in. They go that way. But, he said, look, narrow is the gate, and few there be that find it. Narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. I don't know about you, but I kind of like the idea that maybe I'm not walking with the crowds, and maybe I'm not talking with you know the thousands. Maybe I'm just talking to you and me one-on-one. -on -one, kind of like what Jesus does with me. So today, I pray, you may hear his voice and harden not your heart, as it says in the provocation, but that while we're going through the intensity, the reality, the condensation of the realization of what God is trying to rain upon us, bringing down from heaven that do, literally, from earth, what plant life needs every day to survive, do, which is, you know, kind of like moisture so that the plants could keep going. Um, that do that you are made up of, you know, your body is so much water, almost 90% or something, 93, I can't remember what the exact percentage is, but it's in the 90s, that you need moisture in order to be so filled or so lived with God that you can hear Him and talk to Him. That means you have to have living water the water of the word. And that's what we talk about when we say dew from heaven. That's what we talk about when we say living fountain of waters. It comes from Jesus, but he uses the spirit of God to bring it out of us through the word of God going into us so that inside your mind you got kind of a memory going on, you know, and then all of a sudden there's this like ding, I get it. And you got it, and that's the Holy Spirit. You see? Maybe not, but you'll get it sooner or later. Just pay attention. So, we've been going through Romans in an intensity that reminds us so much so of the fact that Paul, hey, he thought he knew it all. And suddenly went, I could add a V8. That's an old commercial thing, by the way. But literally, instead of being slapped out, he was knocked off his horse. You could say that's the way God operates. He, sooner or later, according to what we're going to read later in Romans, interrupts the show. He steals the scene. He causes your life to get turned upside down. Now, you may not like that. You may not want that. But according to James, we're told to count it all joy. Praise the Lord. Hey, I'm glad that you know things just went kaboom. For me, thank God, 40 years ago when I got saved, it was within 40 days that I was dying of Crohn's disease. I mean, shoot, that was kind of like a great introduction into God and godliness and following Jesus. Dying from a disease that was incurable. Well, I thought following Jesus was just all wonderful. <laughs> well, no, it's not. Jesus said his way of salvation was to take up your cross and follow him. Now, I don't know what your cross is because mine's customized for me and it's Crohn's disease. I don't think you're going to get Crohn's unless you already have it. But if you do, hey, praise the Lord. Count it all joy. For me, it was the most wonderful thing that could have happened. It forced me into dependency upon God. Now, if you're independent without a dependency on God, you need to find one soon. You better make a choice to follow rather than to be followed or pursued by God. Because God's going to squeeze you sooner or later. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And that means if you're really a son of God or you're really a daughter of God, you're going to get beat up <laughs> by life, circumstances, the world. Because to love the world and the things in the world, I mean, you, you really do. You like them, you kind of lust after them, you kind of want them, you know, your smartphone or your games or your box thing, toys. I've never played one, so I just keep imagining because they've got an X on it that you kind of go, G -g 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 -g, you know, do all those things. But I don't. I don't know how. But sooner or later, you're going to have to put it aside. You're going to have to set aside the things that when you were a child, you spoke as a child and you reasoned as a child would. But when you grew to be a man, you put away childish things. And Romans and Titty is what we're doing. Putting away childish things because Romans, we've read and we've understood that Paul had to get knocked off his horse in order to have 
that purity of wanting to make pure the people, but really he was the one that was off track. He was abstract when it came to knowing Jesus or knowing God. Matter of fact, when Paul got knocked off his horse, Jesus said, uh, does it get a little frustrating, you know, fighting against me? Uh, I don't know. Who are you? Because he had been literally knocked down and then blinded. And Jesus said, I'm the one you're persecuting. Oh, no mistake there. Hey, be careful what you think you're criticizing about another. You might be, in fact, criticizing the Lord. So, Paul had to be rearranged, changed, brought into a fellowship with God, a communication. And the way God did it with him was that Paul said, man, I'm messed up. I need to get clean and get out and go and do what Jesus did. So he went out in the desert, and we don't know how long he went. He doesn't describe how many days. He just simply says, I know a man that I know not which, whether in the body or not, that went to be into the heavens. And if he spoke about the things that went on there, it would be a sin. We know by way of study, if you study it and you go through it and you want to you know, do your own personal Bible study, that's Paul. He's talking about himself and he's trying to be humble about it. But Jesus spoke to Paul about the gospel, about what he was doing with the Gentiles. And so the fact that Gentiles weren't getting saved before then was kind of like he had to be Jewish in order to be saved because God chose them and they were supposed to be aware of Jesus coming at the time that he came. They had an idea of somebody was coming or something was going to happen, but they didn't really pick up on God with us. Even though Moses was told, I will be with you. I will be amongst the people. I will walk with you and talk with you. I will whisper in your ear to turn to the right. I'll whisper in your ear to turn to the left. I'll tell you when to be still. I'll tell you when to go forward. Now that's Moses way before Jesus. You could say, the born-again movement was back in uh, Egypt. Hello? Because God spoke to Jacob. God spoke to you know Abraham. God spoke directly to his people. He will speak to you. It doesn't have to be in the Bible. It's a good thing if it is, because it kind of helps you to kind of not think that you got you know somebody playing with your mind until you really understand that you found God speaking to you. Then you go, oh... Man, that was simple. Yeah, it really is. Because it's just like hearing him speak anyways. Because sometimes he might even appear to you. Jesus' movement, that wasn't common, but it wasn't uncommon. So, literally, I would say, pursue God, as A.W. Tozer said, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, like a deer dying for water. Paul did. He went out in the desert and almost died. But, literally, he was taken into heaven and spoken to and then told what he was going to suffer. And man, if there's ever anybody that suffered, we know by verse 1 that Paul really was a servant of Jesus Christ. But we do know that he was called something and he fulfilled it. In other words, many are called, but few are chosen. Paul was called to be an apostle and the church chose a different apostle to be an apostle. Well, that's nice. When it came to be an apostle, you know, nowadays we have Pentecostals that call themselves apostles and we have the Mormon church that calls themselves in their religion apostles and a lot of people that call themselves apostles. The word apostles technically, if you wanted to get down to the nitty gritty, it just means a missionary. It's just a missionary. I'm a missionary at large. I've been called by God to be a missionary. I've been anointed by God to be a preacher. There's a difference. You see, I'm chosen as a preacher at Vidyville Church. I'm called to be a missionary at large. That's what you're called to do. You're called to be a missionary likewise, as Paul was called, called to be an apostle. So, he had been chosen specifically for the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we see in verse 1, and he was a missionary to that, being a evangelist. So we would modern day words say an evangelist, going out and setting up churches, but also preaching the gospel. So, in setting up and in preaching, he was not only a missionary at large, he was building churches, which is what some people define as an apostle. A missionary does the same thing. He's supposed to be doing the same thing, which is what you're supposed to be doing. Your first mission is to your immediate family, to bear your witness, to share your testimony, to declare the things that God has done for you to those around you, so that they can watch and see if it's true. A lot of people suddenly discover what it means to be at odds with their family once they get saved because Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace but a sword. 
father against mother, daughter against father, um, family members against each other, because light and darkness don't mix. And once you're a children of the light, once you're a son of God, once you've been saved, you'll find yourself beginning to be in conflict with those of the world. Because you're not of the world, you're of the kingdom of God. So, Paul, when he was describing that in verse 1, we discussed about in Romans Intensity, we discussed about how America is so much like the Romans, which is what Paul would be writing to today, so he'd be writing to us, which is why we have this intensity of wanting to return to and restore that Bible study we've been doing through the book of Romans as the book of America, because that is really what God is doing, speaking to America right now, today, even as you're listening, as you'll see in each one of these words that we're communicating to you from the Spirit of God. It fits your world right now if you're an American. If you're not an American, well, you know, you might not have it so well as we do in America. The Romans had it very well off. So we've gone through verse 1 and 2, and he said that, Verse 2, we knew that God is God because God could say something before it happens and because he said it before it happens and it happened exactly like he said and never without question, then we know that there is a God and we know that God has fulfilled his word and his word will come true. So that's what we know from verse 2. But also we know more than that, that God will do what he says he will do. He's a doer. What he says he does. As a matter of fact, what he says happens. So... If you hear from God, don't doubt what he says. Doubt that you understand the timing of it. Most people don't. They don't wait long enough for the inheriting the promise. You have need of patience that after you have done the will of God that you might inherit the promise, we're told. And that means that our nature is to be hasty. A hasty people the Lord hates. To hurry up. To want to get things going. To live in a time span that now, 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 get it, get it, get it. Got to go through the drive through to get our food now, cooked instantly. We don't wait on the Lord. Some things in the Old Testament took up to 40 years. Some people waiting for the Lord's return think that it's going to take another 40 years. I got news for you. Jesus is coming sooner than you think. And I don't mean that in the sense of that you're not going to see it. I mean in the sense that you are going to see it. And I'm not going to die before I see the Lord return. Sorry, that's just the way it is. It's going to upset your apple cart if you've got long-term projections for, you know, retirement, grandchildren, children, whatever it may be. And we read in verse 3 that was concerning his son, Jesus Christ, that it was a most miraculous miracle that it could become flesh. The fact that God could suddenly go, shoo. Now, I'll admit, you know, and maybe you've got some games, maybe you're a sci-fi nut, maybe you're a techie, maybe you're a millennial, and you could kind of get the idea of God becoming flesh if your God is, you know, just, you know, like one of the mini universe things. But if you thought of God holding the universe in the distance between your index finger and your palm or your wrist, and he's like bigger than that, ouch. And becoming, you know, pinpoint Jesus, the physical representation of God Almighty. Man, that ought to stop you in your tracks. That ought to be the ultimate science fiction trip. That ought to be like UFO, only not flying, walking, talking, hmm, living with us. If you thought about it, that would kind of trip me out. That's not an alien. That's way out there. It's almost like a UFO landing and saying, Hey, I want to explain to you about God. Well, Jesus came in a non-tech way. He came in the most humble of ways. He messed up every kind of image we would have of God. So maybe our thinking is thinking thinking, and maybe his thinking is the right way when we trust in the Lord with all our heart. Because if we do lean in our own understanding, we're going to get a wrong idea about God. When we lean not in our own understanding, or we become transformed by the renewing of our mind, that means we're putting into our body, soul, and spirit by way of hearing, seeing, understanding, comprehending, thinking, and meditating, and speaking about the Word of God. Because in, like we said about Moses being probably the first born again, you know, Israelites become, a, we're going to make this agreement, you know, we'll agree, you know, and they basically, you know, had God walking and talking and being with them. 
then, hey, like Moses in his day, you know, it comes to be such a miraculous happening that maybe we don't completely understand how God does things. Maybe we don't comprehend how easy it is. Maybe we do get upset at times like Moses did. Maybe I just got off track and I went, where did my thought process go? Right out the window. <laughs> Which happens every now and then when I go way out there into left field. But it'll come back to me before the scripture's over. And so, we recognize that God had already declared that he would be with man back in Moses' day. See, I told you to come back to it. And then, he actually did it physically because he said, look, I gave you the prophets, I gave you the law, I gave you my presence, presence without God being physically in the form of Jesus, all these things, and you didn't get it. Now I sent my only son. Maybe you'll get it. And that's a parable Jesus taught. And yet they crucified him. They didn't get it. And yet he rose from the dead, and they still don't really get it. Finally, in the book of Acts, we find out, how do you get it? Well, the Holy Spirit. How do you get it? Ah, so we don't understand simply by seeing. We don't understand simply by reading. We don't understand by simply by living. We have to understand by leaning not into our own understanding. Huh. That either makes it easier or harder. If you like to be in control, makes it a whole... Keep going with the O's and don't stop. No, it makes it almost impossible for you to understand God. I mean, don't get me wrong, there are people out there that are very intelligent and they want to indoctrinate you to doctrine. I mean, that's what they do. When you got doctrine, you're indoctrinated. When you go systematic, like if you say you have to systematically read your Bible every day and read it according to the numbers that are in here, the numbers were added. The chapters were added. Those aren't part of the original scripture. So, you know, you can go chapter and verse and I use it sometimes. Most of the time I don't. I just kind of read it along and go, oh, I don't know. And God speaks to me. I use it for reference sometimes for people to find it, but that's about it. Other than that, it's really not important. The most important thing is that we, in our finite mind, can't understand the infinite. We can only understand at this moment what God wants to say to us, what he wants to customize to us, what he wants to give to us in this, the book of Romans, the book of America, to you as a person seeking God to know what he has to say to you right now. And in verse 4, here it is. Declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Ouch! Now we'll go back up and read it, you know, kind of down through 1 through 7, so you get it in context, but I'm just going to talk about verse 4 only. So, reading the verse so that you hear the Bible, you know, like people like to say, well, you got to hear a word and you got to have it in context. Paul, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Did you notice three different things there? Which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Now, I find that really interesting because you get all kinds of action words, declared. In other words, it was said that he was the Son of God. It was with, oh, I should keep going. Okay, let me, I said I was going to read it through seven. So, declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship, for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you are also called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that in one of my previous Roman intensities, I said, well, most people, when you're into systematic theology, they say, well, make an outline. And you outline this and you say, well, that's the salutation. No, it's not. There's so much stuff in there that you need to know that you have to accept and behold and become part of that it's really a teaching. He's doing this on purpose to say, I want to shake you up. I want to get you to realize something. I want you to understand in every part of this salutation the reality of what is going on as you are a believer Christian in America, in Rome, in Roman, Romerica, or America, um, how do I say it? Amer-Romans? Amer-Romans. Amer-Romans. 
Emma Romans, Emma Romans. You know, the, the book of America, the book of Romans. He wants you to grasp these things that you know that they are already part of you and truthful. That's why it's a salutation, but really it's a reminder. It's a reflection of God speaking to you and saying, Hey, you, and giving you all the different titles that you are part of. Like people say, study the titles of Jesus. Well, I like to say, I don't follow systematic theology, so I don't make outlines, I don't do it that way, I don't do expositional, I'm not doing expositional. What I'm doing is actually in integral specificity. I believe that the integrity of the scriptures themselves are specific unto the person that's being spoken to, unique and distinctive from anyone else hearing, and so you are the one that God is speaking to. You are going to get something different than what I'm saying, possibly, or what I'm preaching or teaching, or the reality of my focus. The foci is by God talking to you and showing you by your reasoning and rationale according to his will by his spirit making the word of God making the Bible become the word of God by the spirit of God to the people of God of the son of God Jesus because he wants to reveal his son to you because he's so proud of him and he's proud of you being likened unto Jesus in the same way that Jesus is likened unto the Father and if we want to see God in some way we can understand then he gave us his son so that we could see what God is like. Good. And that's what we know God is like. Jesus. You are meant to be like Jesus and God looks at you that way. So the more that you become like Jesus, the better, the more happy, the more fulfilled you will be in life. That's your purpose in life. Your purpose is driven by the fact that you are meant to be like Jesus. So in verse 4, now that we can go back to it after the salutation explanation, we look at it being that, and verse 4 being just a part of, because if you really read it, it's all one run-on sentence, so it goes all the way to the end because it's got the semicolons. But, eh, you know, we're not getting technical. It's just kind of one of those ways of talking in the old days. In royal courts, you know. You would say, and now, O king of all the universe, master of the, you know, and you, know, and you hear a thousand pardons, Absalom, you know, in the old kind of movies that you see about India. Well, that's, or like in king's courts, you know. And they would bow, and they would do these things. And in Hebrew, they actually bow three times forward, once to the right, once to the left, take back three times, and then kind of do this thing, do that, and then step forward, and then step back, and you know. That's all part of prayer. Of course, it's supposed to be symbolic of the temple sacrifices, but those are freebies. Being in verse 4, as we are, speaking to the Americans that are in the Book of Romans, that are actually the Book of Americans, that are speaking to and acting like Romans, that are Christians, here we go. And declared to be the Son of God with power. I mean, you can't get around the fact that, one, there's a declaration being made. Hey! Really, at the baptism, that's where it starts. The declaration, hey, wake up, people. This is my Son in whom I will believe. This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. I mean, there's a few times throughout the book of John and Matthew that we hear that God speaking directly from heaven. The heavens open up, boom. God speaks and everybody goes, Kaboom! Falls down and goes, What was that? When we talk about in just the sentence structure of verse 4, when it says, Declare to be the Son of God with power, he's referring to because it's in the sentence structure of that being the resurrection from the dead. But there was more than that. There's more to be glistened, more to be intensified to your life than just a simply reality of, Resurrected from the dead. Well, that's good. But you see, resurrection from the dead wasn't the only thing that God declared his son of being the son of God by only that as a demonstration of the power, but rather it was his lifestyle, his life of power coming from him. People that came to him were healed. People that talked to him were changed. People were so either move towards following him or rejecting him that they had to kill him because they couldn't stand being in such intensity of light. The same way we've been talking about Moses all the way back to the original time when Moses goes up the mountain, comes down the mountain. Guess what? They put a veil over his face because he was so bright, shining, they couldn't take it. And we're not talking about suntan, baby. We're talking about shining light coming out of his face. And I happen to know what that's like because when I got saved, there were a lot of people around me that were glowing. It was like, Ooh, these people are different.
<laughs> and they were, you know, and it was like, wow, I want that. I want, I want all of it. Uh, it's kind of like greedy. <laughs> well, God showed me I could have all of that, and I did, and I do. It's just, while I'm here, sometimes I have to veil it, so to speak, with my flesh. But the power we're talking about of God is not something that's taken by somebody like a Benny Hinn and knock them dead, you know, or knock them down, or roll them around, or slain in the Spirit, or speaking in tongues. Those are gifts of the Spirit. Those are things people can't abuse. The power of God is something you can't explain to someone else, and that's why I'm going to have a hard time explaining it to you. I've had the power of God in me healing me at times. I've had the power of God through me, speaking to others or healing others. I've experienced God's Spirit of God giving me knowledge I... No way, you know, and that's the gifts that I've said so far. Being healed, speaking, knowing things, doing things. But the power of God is greater than that. It's like watching God move. Like seeing... We like to say nowadays, seeing someone change their life. Well, you know, that's you could take, you know, with a grain of salt because maybe somebody, you know, strains up their act and you think, that, you know, uh, you know, and then suddenly you go, oh, you know, so you, you judge it by the outward things. But when it's the power of God, there's no doubt about it. I mean, people that encounter Jesus, there was nothing that could be said to them to change their mind. They knew what happened. Even in the trial of Jesus, we know that they brought up you know, witnesses and they couldn't get their story straight because when they tried to lie about them, they couldn't really lie effectively. When the blind man was blind and didn't even know who he was, he only goes, hey, I don't know who this Jesus is. I only know that somebody came up to me, rubbed my eyes, bingo, now I was blind, now I see. Now, I don't know who it is. And later on, he got to meet Jesus and said, thank you. But... That's the power of God. The power of God is like something that goes beyond the created universe and doesn't do it like beyond nature because for God it's his nature to do things. It's natural for him. He is spiritual natural. Like we would say, um, we say supernatural, it would be spiritual natural. So, you know, supernatural just means bigger than what we normally understand. Now, at one time, in modern science, which is what most Western culture is about, modern science is kind of a nice thing. It uses examination principles to try to prove something scientifically that they can demonstrate, come up with a conclusion, and relate to it by way of practicing it over and over again to say that this is what's true. And then they change that every few years because they find out something that's an exception to it, <coughs> which simply is observable means. Now, the demonstrative of observable means is beyond our understanding that God can do more, greater, and far beyond than we understood. So when we say supernatural or we talk about the power of God, it's normal for him. We're told by Jesus and by the scriptures and by the word of God continually throughout the entire words that are written in the Old Testament and in the New Testament that signs and wonders would accompany those that believe. Well, here, that's what Paul is talking about. Not a, just a sign, like being born of a virgin, that's a pretty big deal. Because you know, that could be argued somewhere down the road. You know, Now, as far as Jesus was concerned, he didn't know. <laughs> I mean, when he was born, later, he knew. But Signs and wonders are the power of God being made manifest, the natural part of God. It's not a question of some asteroid coming by and going, oh, I think that's a sign, and then turning out, well, I guess that wasn't a sign. It didn't happen, like I said. No, that's not the power of God. The power of God when it came to Jesus was that exactly like it was declared, he rides into Jerusalem on the day that the prophecy would be fulfilled that the the decree of Artaxerxes went forth and that there would not the scepter of the law depart from Judah until the Mashiach come, until the Messiah come. And the last possible generation that could see that happened to be when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. 
And he would declare, Oh, God, save us now. Throwing down their talis katans, throwing down their talis. It wasn't really talis katans out there. Throwing down their blankets, so to speak. Because that's what they carried around. I mean, you could call it a prayer shawl nowadays, but in those days, it's a blanket. You know, they're using a double feature. The poor people, it was their blanket. You know, when the religious people had a separate one, well, that was a talis, you know, with little tied knots so that they could tie you up in understanding their doctrine, you know, and you get all knotted up, you know, from it. I mean, that's the way it works in Judaism. I mean, that's why people that are messianic that tie the talis katans or tie it with zitzis on it are foolish and stupid. I mean, to put it bluntly, because they're just binding themselves to the altar and not freeing themselves like Isaac was a willing sacrifice. He didn't need to be tied up, but that's what they're doing with the, the zitzis on the talis, you know, the pershaw, the little cords that are dangling down. God didn't really say to do it that way. He just said, you know, put some things on the bottom so it looks kind of decorative. That's really what it boils down to. But being that they were set free, they didn't understand the power of God. The disciples looking at Jesus didn't understand he was going to be resurrected from the dead, so he looked forward to being crucified. They didn't understand the reality that we're talking the ultimate power that is beyond presidencies or governments or life itself that exists in eternity. And that's what God used in order to declare his son. We have heaven rolled back for a moment and angels shouting out. That's the power of God. The power of God is something that goes far supernaturally beyond just gifts and things that might be questionable, like a golden tablet with spectacles to find out what God said. No, we're talking about no doubt about it. I can tell you this, when a person knows Jesus, there's no doubt about it. They can't be shaken. I mean, literally, you can't. I mean, I, I personally, God spoke to me, and I can't take that away. And that's why I have to. There is a compulsion upon me to teach. There is a reality of, I absolutely do not live unless I give out what I got in. Because it comes from an inexhaustible source that is internally connected with God forever. I can't be less than what I am because I perish that I don't do what God tells me to do. And that's what it is about the power of God. Really. It's a connection that cannot be broken. It's a reality that is so fulfilling that it just flows automatically out of you. It's like me sitting here and going, hey, you know, a bro over there was, you know, he kind of wrote down, you know, hey, DJ, or, I can't think of his, I was going to give his initials, but I didn't want to give it away. But anyways, D something. But anyways, the point being is that, you know, he saw one of the videos, commented on it, and, uh, you know, I don't get a lot of comments, but so I wrote back, you know. But it was like I listened to the video for a minute, and I went, yeah, that's pretty good. We should do that some more, Lord. And Lord said, do it. And I said, okay, so here we are. Now, how did I, did I prepare for it? Did I sit down and go, okay, I'm going to do, like, you know, all my outlines, you know, and I'm going to listen to the last three of them, or the last four, however many I've done. I've done a lot of them. You know, and I'm going to make sure that I'm going in and say, no. I picked up a Bible, I put my camera over there, I put my chair over here, and I opened it up, and I said, here, God, am I, send me, or speak through me, in this case. And he does. And that's what being led by the Spirit is like. The wind bloweth whither will, you neither know where it's coming from nor where it's going. So, too, is everyone led by the Spirit of God. God's Spirit is just simply God speaking. It's if you're, Jesus is talking to you, that's God's Spirit. If you're seeing God, that's God's Spirit. If you're knowing God... God's Spirit doesn't talk about Himself. Jesus said, I will send you another comforter, and He will not speak of Himself, but He will speak of me. He will remind you of the things with which I said. He will demonstrate to you who I am. He will cause you to understand. He will convict you of sin. He will do these things in the as though He were God, because He is God. He's God's Spirit of representation here on the earth now while Jesus is gone. But He's meant to comfort you. He's meant to teach you. You have no need that any man teach you, but the Spirit of God who dwells within you, He will lead you into all truth. The reality of truth is what's manifested in how God takes the book and makes it the Word of God. That's why Jesus said, I am the truth. I am the way. I am the life. Look in the volume of the book. All of it speaks of me. And it does. And so that's why... The power is really all of these things that we've mentioned so far. And it's according to the spirit of holiness. Holiness one time was described to me, and I still can't find out 
who did it. I keep wanting to say it was Romaine. I blame a lot of things on Romaine. He's a Marine Corps drone instructor who was very practical. Very reality, just this is what it says. Do you do it? If not, then you why? You know, you're in rebellion. You either do it or you don't. I mean there's no question. Yes and no, or yes or no. You know. So the point being is there's no gray areas. And maybe he said I don't know, but he said the spirit of holiness was wholeness, completeness, the reality of you being all of God intended you to be. Now, I like Rick Warren. I love Rick Warren. I mean, I think he's anointed by God. He's called, chosen, and appointed to be the only pastor I know of that can pull off a megachurch. Because he's got mega ministries that are all connected, and he ministers to all of them. He's very specific about being a part of them. Other mega churches, no, nah, I'm sorry, I don't support them at all. You know, I'm sorry, I just don't think that's the way God intended. I think God always uses one exception out of the ordinary, but the the normal normative church should be about you know 12, 120, 70, something like that. You know, like a community church. Otherwise, you don't know what they're doing. You don't know the people. You know, just, you know, don't tell me about mega churches. Tell me about what God is doing, but. God used Rick Warren in such a way with the book that he was willing to give away his own preconceived ideas, the purpose-driven life. Now, a lot of people dogmatize that and make it into something that they have to do and without letting it, like the book says, to let God speak to you as he will and cause you to be born again and follow him. But there is more to the purpose-driven life than a, a purpose in life. It is a purpose-driven meaning that God's purpose is to have you whole, complete, your body, your soul, and your spirit, one unity in Echad, in the unity of God Almighty, the Elohim, the manifestation of Father, Son, and Spirit that we call the Trinity, which is really a bad name. But anyways, the point being is that we're, we're tripartite the same way that God is. Individuality of our soul is different than our spirit, and our spirit is different than our flesh. And you obviously know that, and you've experienced it maybe. If not, you will eventually. But God wants those parts of our being to be complete, to be perfect, to be whole, to be holiness. And the reality of that is manifested in the book of Revelation when he says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, who is to come. Really, it's like, Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit, holy cow! <laughs> no, that's you. <laughs> You're already for the slaughter. <laughs> no, but you know, there's no holy cows in heaven. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. Don't tell me about bulls and all the different angelic beings. Those aren't cows. Those are beings. They have a purpose. They were designed that way. And so your purpose-driven life is to become holy, complete, perfect. And the only way you can is when Jesus stood up and said, Hey, these are my sayings. Do them. You'll be perfect. Be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Be holy. Really is what he was saying. Be complete. Be that with which God could say, I declare you, you that's watching, me as I'm teaching or preaching, to be sons of God. That means we're complete. Hey, as far as God's concerned, we're there. As far as we're concerned, eh, eh. So we got God on the upper and we on the lower and, you know, huh. Sorry, when I look at you, it's like, uh-uh. But when God looks at you, it's like, uh-huh. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's really what God sees you. That's my kid. <laughs> I'm proud of him. And that's what he's saying in verse 4. About his own son declared with power to be the Spirit of God by the resurrection from the dead. So, by the Spirit of holiness is the Spirit with which the Holy Spirit was able to take and look at the Son and say, Perfect. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And that's what Jesus made himself in the likeness to be, the servant of God. He was and is and ever shall be the son of God. We are called to be more than what we are, fulfilled only when we finally become resurrected from the dead. When we finally go beyond our capability in our life to be what we were, which is dead flesh walking around, the walking dead like the TV programs, literally dead in our own Activities, our own thoughts, our own ways, our own actions, our own attitudes, our own own. We the people being the worst form of government, and we the people being the worst form of self-determination, and we the people being the worst form of creation, isn't about we, but about he. 
And so every time we say we, it ain't he, and it's all about me. Because whenever you see anybody that says we, they're talking about me, and they don't care about all the rest of the people that are the we. They only care about number one, me. And really, when you get to that selfish attitude of me, myself, and I, or you put the I in it, Jesus didn't use himself as an example. He always spoke of his father. There's none good but his father. Call no man father but his father. Call no man good except for God, and the only one that's good is his father. I mean, really, the boiled down to satisfaction that comes from is the reality of knowing that, yeah, you have no good thing in you. In you there dwelleth no good thing. But the reality of who is dwelling within you is Jesus who is good by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the power of holiness, completing you, making you fulfilled in what God created you to be, accomplishing and accomplishing his will as he makes you into a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. You are no longer the we. You're no longer the me. You are I that no longer liveth, but Christ liveth in me. The life that I now live, I live by the will of the Son of God who died for me and gave himself for me. It is the resurrection from a dead life in the world to a resurrection life by being born again. Not of the flesh, but born of the Spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Being resurrected unto a new hope a new attitude, a new confirmation. It's not from baptism of the external things that's going to save you. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit within you that is the testimony of perfection in you working to cause from the inside out that renovation project that makes your outside die and become less so important as your inside glows and becomes more so a reality of Jesus in you. For this is the determination of what the explanation of eternal life is. And this is eternal life that they should know me and know him who sent me. So eternal life is simply knowing Jesus, A, and knowing who sent him, God, B, his Father. And the only way we can know him is A, Jesus said, no man cometh to the Father but by me. And Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will cause you to know me, to understand me, to reveal Really, when you become born again, you should be pursuing knowing God. And if that means you've got to get more of the Spirit, then let me tell you a little parable that will kind of wrap this all up for you in a kind of a nutshell. Is uh, We have a parable that Jesus told, a story. Stories, uh, you know, people are going to explain a thousand different methodologies of what a parable is. And God knows most of them aren't Jewish. <laughs> Rabbinical parabolics, meaning that where most Christians in systematic theology get their idea of what Jews believe is from encyclopedias, maybe some talking a little bit, or maybe specifically some historical references, but for the most part they deal with rabbinicism the rabbinical way or the rabbi's way of defining what a Jew is. I personally understand Jews. <laughs> no offense, you know, I mean, you know, you know. it's a long story, but we won't go there. But a Jew is a Jew. I mean, that's the way it is. You don't have a choice. A Jew is a Jew, you know what I mean? We're going to get into Romans where it really gets confusing for some Christians because they're going to go, he who is a Jew is a Jew of the heart and not of the flesh only. So, you know. Uh, it's a play on that later on Chabad, which is a uh, Jewish organization of, you could say, evangelical, not believing in Jesus, but evangelical in Judaism, uh, Jewish uh, people that believed in a spiritual kind of Judaism. Um, they used to say that, hey, you know, which one is a Jew? Well, the one that, if you read the Torah and the man, wow, you know, that's a Jew. The one that doesn't react, he's not a Jew, he's a castaway. And that's what uh, the old sages in Chabad taught. Well, that's kind of what Romans is going to mention later on. Those that react to and want to follow Jesus, hey, they're Jewish. They're chosen. And that's what it really means, chosen. Because there is no such thing as a Jew. Jewish, or Chabiru, or you know, however you want to get into the original words, doesn't matter, are simply those that were vagabonds traveling through, moving from tent to, you know, kind of like the we see the nomadic life, you know, the tent dwellers, 
the sons of, um, I can't think of which one it was, but it says that even to this day they dwell in tents. And they do to this day in Israel. They have TV antennas on top of their tent. They have all these things on top of their tent. They're called the, um, boy, my mind's just went on that one. Uh, the, hmm. And they have no border. They have no allegiance. They just wander, and so they get into trouble all the time. And you know, even Israel is kicking them out of some of the properties and taking it away so they can build more land for Jews than for them. Even though they're probably the original landowners, so to speak, although they didn't own it, they just traveled through it. They kept their vow to God, and so that's what they are to this day. They fulfilled, and God can say, "Look, that's one of my words being fulfilled." And they're the. Wow, it'll come to me when I'm talking about something else, too. So, anyways, that being said, being that now my mind is really gone because it's stretched so hard trying to remember that name, we find ourselves not so much limited to being as what we were, being born of a woman, being the seed of our father, being stuck in maybe even some of the curses that have come down to the third and fourth generation from our previous either you know bastards that some of us are or maybe your father was an abuser or a drug addict or he didn't stick around and he divorced your mother or maybe your mother divorced you and you know got rid of you and you're an adopted or you moved around or whatever it may be in reality there were no Jews to begin with and as such God looked down and said who will I choose and Abraham was in Ur of the Chaldees called Abram at the time and we don't know why God chose him it doesn't say God said Abraham he looked up and said you're kidding <laughs> but no God chose a man at one point in time and took him out of Ur of the Chaldees to follow him to give and to be a father of many nations not just the Jewish nation but many nations and all the nations of the world would be blessed through him, not through just Israel, the nation, which is a lot of people today have really messed that one up. I mean, I don't understand how they can mess. I do understand how they can mess up scriptures because they say, you've heard this expression previously, they're fixed it, sort of. But you know, God won't give you anything bigger than you can handle. Well, the scripture that comes from it is, there hath no temptation you've taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful and will not suffer you to be tempted, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you be able to bear it. They don't add the last part. You might have a bigger temptation you can handle, but he's going to give you a way of escape. They just say, oh, God won't give you anything bigger than you can handle. And you just figure, oh, well, then I can handle everything. No, you can't. God is the one who has to give you and allow you and show you the way out. So that one's as messed up as you know, the blessing goes down through Jacob and then now to Israel, the nation today. Moses and Elijah are coming to a nation that is apostate, that does not believe in God today. Even now in Israel, you're not going to find a whole lot of people believe in God. Even the rabbis, most of them are going to say, well, you know, God doesn't, you know, that was a nice idea then, but now we have this other thing. You know, I mean, that's bottom line. That's Israeli Jew today. So, when God chose someone, he wasn't birthright from Genesis all the way up to Abraham, a Jew. No. One day he decided, I will make a people out of your loins. And so from that moment on, Abraham was not a Jew who gave birth to who would become Jews. Isaac, which is a type of Jesus. Later to Jacob, who is Israel, literally. And to Ishmael, who really is what Gentiles are, which is kind of what we are, which is kind of where the Arabs come from, so to speak. Ishmaelites, so, so in reality of kind of making them to be, you can either be chosen or not chosen. So guess what, you know? And Israel had, as it were, through the years, people who were non-Jewish by direct descendancy become part of the nation or the children of Israel wandering. That's kind of the plan of salvation that was meant to be an example for us to learn from. So we're going to find that in all of that, Christians looking outward or looking backward trying to identify Jewish thought really don't understand what they're saying when they go to rabbinical sources. The rabbis, without God, decided to invent their own understanding to create a Judaism that, frankly, is leading Israel into apostatism 
that they will never find God, that God was not in the temple at the time that Jesus was born. Because God was in Jesus and there was no miracle happening in the temple during the sacrifices. It just wasn't happening. Prior to the pig being slaughtered in the temple, you know, during the Maccabees, when a high priest kills a Jew, that's not very uh, Christian or godly, but they did it. So, at the time when that happened, the Spirit of God was gone. There was like, they say a silence. Well, it wasn't really a silence so much as it was one of those times of God going to fulfill His Word in the person of Jesus, but it would not happen until they waited to see what the actual temple of God would be. And it wasn't with man. And it wasn't by the hands of man, but by the will of God. By being in Jesus. And we find ourselves as being the temple of the Holy Spirit. The same way that Jesus was with the Holy Spirit coming upon him at his baptism. And then baptizing him in the Holy Spirit at the same time. Some people it happens that way. Most it doesn't. There's two separate events. It can be the same event. That's why there's so much confusion in systematic theology and not in integral specificity that I preach or teach or am a part of. So, having a mindset when they try to explain Jewish thought, you know, coming to the scriptures, they only deal with it from a relatively outsider looking towards it perspective. Reality of what God wanted to do all along is always speaking to man. And it didn't matter whether he did it through a prophet like Balaam, and Balak, the story you know, that the prophet you know, wanted to curse and was paid to curse and couldn't, but he told him how to mess him up anyways. But Balaam was a prophet of God, and he wasn't Jewish. Think about that for a while. That's interesting. So, God isn't limited by man's understanding and systematic theology of trying to explain how Jewish mindset works, because if you're not Jewish, you don't understand it. So, when they try to make that scriptural apply of blessing the nations through blessing Israel, they that bless you will bless you, you're the apple of my eye. You better be careful about how you're applying that because it's the Spirit of God that applies that, not man making an interpretation of that. And so that's why we study to show ourselves approved, to work for that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing or taking apart the Word of God and then going, Wow, look at this, Lord, and then doing what we're about to do, saying, show me, Daddy. Tell me what it means. If he wants you to know, he'll tell you. If he wants certain parts of it to apply, he'll apply it. But he won't make up Santa Claus to you, like some people do with some promises. He won't make up the tooth fairy, like some people do with claiming it and naming it. He will speak to you like a son. So, Father, I thank you that today you have chosen to use a way that makes sense to us. You have called us to be like your son. You have proven to us that you have demonstrated by power who your son is. It isn't a question of some other Jesus like the Mormons have, or some other Jesus like the Jehovah's Witnesses want, or some other Jesus like some people claim, but the power of God through the spirit of holiness, by the very nature of who the Holy Ghost is, who the nature and reality of you being here with us in the Comforter, in Him who is to teach us, to guide us, to give us to ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart to understand, by His own way and will, reveals to us through power that Jesus is the Son of God, but more so the reality of also Him applying it to our lives as we've read, to become like Jesus, to follow Jesus, to know Jesus, to hear Jesus speak, to know that we are the children of God becoming sons and daughters of God. That I thank you for, Jesus, by being our high priest in heaven, allowing us that spirit within us to be taught by you. So I pray, Father, for those that have watched today and have heard your voice. I pray for those who have not heard but do not know but are coming closer to the reality of being born again. I ask, Spirit of God, that you would fill those whom, likened unto the nature of the virgins who were looking for Jesus' return, some were not filled enough with the Holy Spirit. Don't take away what little bit there is among the believers now, O oh God, who want to know you, but rather, if they've even wanted to at some point in time, 
understand you or know you better, then give them more of your spirit. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I hope that you continue on to the fulfillment of your destiny. Because some vessels, some people, a vessel is a person, some vessels are for honor and some for dishonor. You can't have hell enlarged unless there's some people going there. But heaven is wide open for those who choose to pursue Jesus. For even in 1 John we're told, He who has the Son has life. But he who is not the Son of God has not life. So if you don't have the Holy Spirit and you're not saved, then let me say something clearly. Stop what you're doing. Get saved. No matter what, get saved. Don't go after more. Just get saved. If you are saved, then pursue more to go on to, as we're reading in Romans, the knowledge of the reality of Jesus. Now, at the same time that we're talking about those that are already Christians, as Paul was writing to the Romans, you're going to find that a lot of Christians are carnal or not saved. They're called, but they're not chosen. That's why if you are not saved, you can be saved by watching these or learning or continuing to grow. Take what you understand, ask God to show you, and ask God for you to know what he's talking to you and to lead you what you need to understand so that you can be not the Son of Man, but more likened unto the Son of God.